Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this year's first session of Conversations in Conflict Studies. My name is Logan Carnicelli, and I am a graduate assistant uh, here at the Program for the Advancement of Research on Conflict and Collaboration, also known as PARC, and it's my pleasure to be hosting this presentation series. Today we're here with University Ombuds, Neil Paulus. Neil has been a member of Syracuse University since 2004 in the roles of master student, PhD student, academic affairs staff, student affairs staff, and has taught in three of the 13 colleges here at SU, experiencing various conflicts in each space. Today's conversation, titled The Spiral of Conflict, How We Fall Into It and How We Can Dig Our Way Out, is a testament to what Neil has been saying since becoming University Ombud three, three years ago. And that is that conflict is not a sign of failure. Conflict is an opportunity to learn more about yourself and the people you work with. The spiral of personal conflict acknowledges an individual process of managing conflict that has been influenced directly by observations in his work, psychology, media, as well as Eastern and indigenous theories and concepts. Neil, thank you for being here today, and let me turn it over to you. The floor is mine, huh? Absolutely. Well, Welcome, everybody. It's good to be here in part of heart. Yeah, go ahead. You can clap. <laughs> sure. Just because we're recording doesn't mean you need to be quiet. <laughs> we still have the people that watch the video. Be like, someone was actually there, right? <laughs> um, so thank you for coming. I appreciate it. You know, I, I, even as a student here and having worked in all those different spaces at Syracuse, I never really knew much about Park. Uh, even though basically I've been working in conflict and transitions my entire time here at Syracuse since 2004, um, I haven't formally been part of this group until I started being an ombuds and was invited in. And I, I, I'm glad to be here. It's exciting to be in this space and to be part of the conversation about how do we transition through. So obviously with my background and my history, um, it does come from a psychological individual perspective, um, but what was interesting is when I took this job, one of my teachers uh, said, oh, that's good that you took that job. And I said, great, thanks, I agree. And she said, well, you were always, you were always interested in systems, was her answer. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I thought I was more of a counselor. <laughs> but, um, but she said, no, 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 you, you were always had this understanding that we're all impacted by our systems. And I was like, hmm, what does that mean? <laughs> So I had to kind of delve into that further, right? So occasionally I might cough, just so you know, I got a lot of water over here. It's not, I'm, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it was a great time to pause. Yeah, so oh, come on in. Join the party. Yeah, grab a seat. Hi, welcome. More people. For those of you that, are, that don't see the crowd, there's hundreds of people here. <laughs> Um, we're all interested in conflict. So, <clears throat> so what is the what is the journey, right? Why is it this working? We'll try this first. We we'll use the arrow. Oh, click the click the mouse on the. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So, um, I kind of look at our journey in the world as this kind of journey over the waterfall, right? Um, and once water goes over that edge, you know, it can never really go back, right? It has to go through a whole other journey. It's, of, a, it's of, a journey that goes over the waterfall. It, it's a journey over the waterfall, but then it has to evaporate and go into the clouds and go through this other process and then be dropped in the right spot to then come back up to the ground to then possibly go back over that water again, right? So there's this whole cycle of life and the journey, right? And, and so really when we think about our lives, we're falling over all these water waterfalls all the time. <clears throat> and there's really not an opportunity to kind of understand the process that we'll have to go to come back to that waterfall and fall down that same one. So it's kind of like learning on the fly, right? Learning in the moment. And we fall, and then we have to respond once we land, right? And to me, that's a, it's a great analogy of what is conflict and what is that transition and that evolution. And how do we then respond? once we've gone through that. Um, and so for me, I love this picture, one, because it's beautiful of the waterfall, but two, because it really represents life for me. 
right, of that journey and that it can be scary sometimes, right? When we get to that point where we recognize that I'm about to be in conflict or I got to have that conversation with somebody or I'm struggling, you know that you're on the edge of that cliff and you're about to go. So, um, yeah, so this is a little bit of an inspiration for me on my work and how I do it and how I help people manage that because I understand, I think, where they are when they come into my office. What are they going through? They've tried all kinds of other things. They've talked to other people. They've talked to their loved ones. They've pastored their loved ones, usually, right? Because now their loved one is like, oh my gosh, I've heard enough. Tell somebody else. Find someone else to help you, right? And they try all these other things that have worked in the past, right? And so they're, this is the moment, right, of when do I do something new? So. Yeah, so I think we can all appreciate the moment, right? Okay, I got this, but yeah, oh, yeah go. it's good. <laughs> so I know this is this picture is a little blurry because I kind of stretched it and, and moved it around, but this is a painting by Oren Lyons, alumni of Syracuse University. <laughs> and what you have here on the left, on the lower left, is a group of Haudenosaunee um, war chiefs and warriors, right, who had their own war parties from a variety of different communities. And they're coming. Come on in. Yeah, they're coming. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Just hop on in. Find a space. Hop on in. Got to seats in the back. Yeah. You're just in time for story time. <laughs> yeah. Story time is now. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I am Native American, I'm Haudenosaunee, so I grew, up, um, I grew up with these stories and access to these stories my whole life. And what's interesting is I had heard this story of the Confederacy and how it was formed and the flag, the purple flag, right, with the five squares, if you've seen it on campus, right, and maybe not knowing what it was. The five squares. That's a whole other conversation, right? <laughs> But each one of those squares represents one of the member nations of the Haudenosaunee, and they're a grouping and collaboration to become a democratic process of a unified nations, right? And so what these war chiefs actually are is they're war chiefs within each one of those five nations, right? And they were fighting each other. Um, we talk about blood wars, right? We talk about cannibalism as part of the process, right? And so to tell the whole story of how this piece comes to be takes about 10 days. So I'm, I'm totally just <laughs> splashing it with paint, right? And totally not doing it to do uh, because it deserves a lot more. But I want to bring this up because I want you to understand something. That to move through from war and cannibalism it's a piece. What needs to happen? Conflict. conflict. Well, you're certainly in conflict <laughs> when you're eating each other, right? And you're eating your pizza, right? So, mm -hmm. hope that doesn't ruin anyone's appetite. Conflict. Transformation. Transformation. That's absolutely perfect. It tra transformation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it is a transformation from war from to war peace, to peace, right? And that transformation or change has to come with a process. So there was a messenger or a speaker uh, that, that brought this idea and concept and message to our people and introduced it to the war chiefs. And this is why this story takes so long. And each one of them, kind of in their own way, starts to begin to accept this piece. And they all start to agree, as they all begin to agree to peace, that there is this one person in the world. Come on in. Come on in. You want pizza too? So they all agree that in order to have this peace, that this one man, named Todd, no, this one man, the most violent and vicious of all, has to agree to peace or there can't be peace. Because otherwise they'll still continue to have all this warmongering and this fighting, right? This sounds familiar probably in some of your own studies, socially, culturally, all around the world. Right, there's always someone that wants to continue the fight. Right? And so we had that person. That's this guy right here on the right. And he's known as, his name was Tadadaho. And right now, if you hear about Tadadaho, 
And you might have met him when he spoke at the Dome and did an opening address and welcomed you to the Lions of the Living Shoni. Right? So that name, that seat, like the seat of the presidency, continues to be a seat and gets filled by a new person or that person passes on to put a new person in. And so what does that seat represent? That represents this man, the most terrible and terrible of all. Right? <clears throat> and so what is his story? And really to understand transition is you have to understand the story. So, how to doubt his backstory. <coughs> and this is cool, because he's an Onondaga eel. And I am an Onondaga eel. And I grew up in Onondaga. And I had never heard this story until about four years ago. So, <coughs> so this, is, this is pretty cool, right? So you're all privy to some really cool information. And so in Six Nations, they tell the story about Tanadaho's backstory. So Tanadaho, like the peacemaker who brought this message of peace, it's actually like how we resolve grief, right? Um, that turns into a political process as well. So you resolve grief personally, you resolve it politically, and you create a space of collaboration, communication, and consensus. So you have this one descending thought or person. So <clears throat> you have this messenger, right, powerful person, and you have this other impending powerful person, the opposing force. And uh, if we understand Tanadaho's backstory, he was a young kid with vision, and he had the ability to see and to speak. And so what would happen is, is mom would grab Tanadaho's hand, oh, it's, it's tall, right? <laughs> so mom would grab Tanadaho's hand and bring him to the village, right? Because yeah. they lived just outside. And she would walk into the village, and everyone would be excited. And they would say, oh, hey, hi, how you, how you doing? They'd be excited. <laughs> and, he'd say, and he'd say, oh, I see you sneaking from um, lodge to lodge. Right? <laughs> and now you have a wife and kids. Ooh, what does that do, right? All of a sudden, everyone, the conversation stops, right? So she starts walking along, and someone else comes by. Hey, how you doing? Hey. Oh, yeah, hi, yeah, you hide food, but you have visitors come over to your house, don't you? Guilty. Yeah, guilty mm -hmm. as charged, right? College student. Yeah, so <laughs> hiding her food, right? So he started to show and air their secrets, right? And every time they went to the village, they would be excited to see them, but then he would always share these visions that he had about these people. And it, still, it slowly began that as they were coming to the village, less and less people would talk to them. But it got to the point where they go to the village and no one would talk to them. So then one day, mom. Good morning. So one day, mom decides to leave Tadadaho at home. <coughs> right? Excuse me. So mom decides to leave Tadadaho outside the village. And she walks in and, oh! Is everyone excited that Todd is not there? <laughs> right? Everyone's so happy and they're hugging her and they're talking to her. And now now that her secrets are being aired out. And she gets to talk to all her old friends and her buddies and all her family members, right? And she gets excited. So then she comes back and leaves and goes back to her lodge. Then she decides to go back another day. And she says, Well, I'll try that again. So she leaves Todd in the woods again. And she stays in the village for a longer time, right? But, well, yeah, for a longer time. Well, a longer time. <clears throat> and all oh, the happiness she has again. So she begins to take Todd, Todd Adalho, right, deeper and deeper into the woods and leaving him for longer and longer periods of time. Deep in. So that she can spend time with her friends and in, in the village and in the community, right? So what's happening to poor Todd? Right? He's in what? He's abandoned. He's in the woods, right? He's all by himself. But he's this powerful being. He has all these visions, right? So eventually it gets to the point where mom just abandons him and leaves him in the woods for good. And lets him fend for himself. He lives, he lives, he dies, he dies. Right? So what does Todd do, this powerful being who has the power of his visions, right? He finds a way to live among the animals. And he connects to that spirit. But what, else, what happens to Todd's heart? Well, he shrivels. 
It yeah. shrivels like that Grinch. Right? <laughs> yeah, it shrivels, it shrivels, shrivels like the Grinch. It's like Darth Vader. Is what I it's think. Darth Vader. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's every it's villain Vader. you've ever heard. <laughs> It's, it's the back story of every and villain and every good movie. And every right? good, it really is. And every yeah. good movie. It's very similar. Yeah. So here he is, abandoned, alone, mm -hmm. angry. So no wonder he killed, raped, murdered, and ate every human being he came into contact with. Every human being. And no wonder he would be the most terrible of terrible. Right? <laughs> so they can say that there's a stone over by, um, by Destiny Mall, mm -hmm. over there near the... Uh, the sewage treatment plant, mm -hmm. where there's a stone where it looks like it's two feet, where they he'd say he used to, it was near his dwelling, and he would stand and wail and scream and tell the children to go. Mm -hmm. And then he would be so caught up by his anger that he would go and attack. Mm -hmm. Okay, So that's Tadadatha's backstory. So now all these war chiefs are saying, we can't have peace unless Todd agrees. He's got he's to gotta change. So they try to attack him, and Todd's so powerful, he raises the winds and turns the canoes over, and they fall out of the canoe, and they go back, and they say, oh, we've got to try that again. And the peacemaker remembers, well, the first person that accepted this message of all these people was a woman. Her name was Dragunsese. She was their clan mother. And when Dragunsese accepted that message, she said, I will share this message among the women. You share this message among the men. And so she was doing her... her like I said, 10 days to tell the story, right? <laughs> so, so, she, so he calls to her, and she comes, and she agrees to join these war chiefs. And as they come across the water to his dwelling, she begins to sing a song. And the war chiefs begin to join into that song. And that song is said to be able to calm Tadadaho's heart, and he allows them to enter their space. And he enter his dwelling, and then Jagunsa say, Hiawanta and the peacemaker comb the snakes from his hair. Comb the snakes. And they, and comb they, the they snakes. Release him from being held mm -hmm. that way. And they say they straightened the seven cricks in his back. Anyone doing Quit. meditation or Quit. yoga? Mm -hmm. Right? How many chakras? Seven. 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 Mm -hmm. seven. Yeah, so they straighten the seven cricks in his body and they stand him up straight as a man. And they put him through this grieving process. And they return him to the community. But he says, well, I'll accept this peace, but I need something special. And I said, well, you can get something special, but then you have to give us something too. It can't just be a one-way street. You have to give too. So Tadadaho has to agree to give up his land, his name, and his, his title. So he has no clan, he has no nation, and he has no ability to own any land. But he is now the protector of all who are showing him. That is his duty. And the other duty he has is he calls us to meetings. So it's time to meet, he says, it's time to meet. And we all come to meet. That's the only thing that makes him different than any of those other chiefs, is he calls them to meetings. Otherwise, they're all equal. Only he's different, right? Because he's also elected by all the other chiefs. So that is the backstory of Tadadaho that I never knew. And I was like, why don't I know this? This is crazy. I'm from Onondaga. I grew up here. How do I told my sister. She's like, I never heard that too, right? She's, you know, a number of years older than me, right? And I'm like, how do we not know this, right? And so I love this story because it, it talks about that transformation and that transition and what needs to exist. What did Jagunsa say bring to Tadadaho in that story? What did she bring? Someone else besides Tina. Song. Song. Calming presence. Calming presence. So what is that? Rep yeah. So it's representative of what? The unconditional love of mother. Right? So it's that unconditional love, that forgiveness, that is returned to him, that restores him. So that's the transition and the restoration within that story of that flag. So th this whole story exists within that thing that flies around this campus all over. Yeah. That's this message of peace. It's a message of park. 
It's a message of relationships and transition. It's a message of all of that. Right? It's a message of how we get along as people together in unity as one. So, like I said, 10 days. I'm not doing a service, but this is just one little snippet and piece of it, and I'm pulling from other parts of that 10-day story. Right? So this is my inspiration and my theory right? that informs me on what is it that we need when we're in struggle, when we're in conflict, when we're on the top of that cliff, right? when we're about to fall over that waterfall. What do we need in that moment to brace our fall, to brace our journey that we're about to go into as we transition? So here's my kids. One of them's right here. This is Max. This is a number of years ago, right, um, when I was trying to create a space uh, for us to transition. <coughs> so I love this Henry Ford quote. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Um, so what I do with my kids, and I've done it for many years, and still do it, um, is we go on trips, and I take pictures. So I have hundreds of pictures. Half of them look like this. <laughs> uh, that me what my eye call because I feel like I'm sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> you're sleeping, or you're angry, right? Angry. So this was my trick. This is my trick. Uh, so this is a little parenting trip for you if you want pictures of your kids to be smiling, right? Mm -hmm. How many people like to ruin pictures? I know I do, yeah. right? I love to make dumb faces and goofy faces and all kinds of stuff. And um, I used to have family members to say, Neil, you always ruin our pictures, uh -huh. right? So what I do is, the first thing I do when I'm going to take a picture, I say, all right, kids, grumpy face. Yeah. And they'll, uh, they, they all do their best friend face. And I'm like, hold it, hold it, come on, right? And, uh, right? and so I'm taking a couple of pictures. And I'm like, okay, smiley face. And they're like, ha, ah, and they're literally laughing at themselves being grumpy, right? And it's teaching them that they get to choose how they feel at any moment in time. Not me. I'm not telling them be angry or sad. I can't make them happy or sad. They might respond to something I say or do in that way and try to blame me. But at the end of the day, they're 100% accountable for how they feel. Right? And so here's them being angry literally seconds later. Right? They're laughing. I have tons of those pictures. Right? They're literally like in the same spot. And they're, they're angry and then they're happy. So this is obviously a trip to Niagara Falls. But we have the opportunity to choose so if you think you are, you think you're not, you're probably right. You're right. I'm doomed. Right? What are you creating? Right? How are you creating a feeling within that space? Right? I'm struggling. Oh my gosh, right? So however those are. I'm successful. Right? So we can do all of those things, right? As long as we believe it. So uh, here we are in our space of success, and we're believing, and we're, we're navigating that. What's, what's about to happen here? Uh, not the crib. That's the crib. And the guy's walking across on a, on a, on a tree. Hey. What are some things that could happen right here? He's going to make it to the other side. He's going to make it to the other side. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so where's the, where's the gonna pessimist? Fall. He's going to fall. He's going to fall. Okay, where is it? It's going to be really funny. It's going to be really funny, right? Where is he going to fall? Like, next step? In the water? Three steps. Oh, he's going to fall right into the water. Maybe he falls right off the log, right? Maybe yeah. he falls right off. Maybe he falls and lands on the log first. Ooh. And then he falls in. Ooh, we saw, we've all seen those videos, right? Right? He falls to the side, right? Land on his side, then fall in. Does his legs go out? Right? All kinds of different opportunities. Right? And things, right? Some of them funny, some of them not so funny. Some of them right? not so funny. One option is he makes it across. One right. agenda that he made the we, have, we are always navigating this journey, this balance. We're on this balance beam. Are we going to fall? Am I going to screw up? Am I going to miss it? Am I going to stay balanced? How do I feel? Oh my gosh. Right? Anyone try to do that? Is it, has anyone done this? You, right? You're laughing. Yeah. Did what? you make it? Then I remember, yeah. You <laughs> what? The quick is at our house. Yeah. So he made it across, right? Mm -hmm. The cookie that I have. Yeah, so you all kind of understand and know what this is like, right? 
This is navigating that conflict. This is navigating that transition. Right? Okay. Same thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who feels like this right now? Anyone almost done with the program? <laughs> Hoping to graduate? <laughs> All right? Yeah, what's the next step? What's next? Where do I go? What do I do with this piece of paper now that I have it? Right? Where do I go? What's next? What's the next step? Sometimes the next step isn't clear. Right? That last guy, you know the next step is on the log. Oh, yes. This guy, he doesn't know where his next step is or where it's going to go. Might go down the cliff. Might go right down now. the cliff. He might have to turn around. Right? Oh, no. Yeah. He might have to find a new way around. Yeah. Or maybe he's about to dive off and swim away. We don't know. Right? We don't know how far. Okay. Looks like the water's pretty far down. Right? Or he could be Leonardo DiCaprio. The one, but he's not down. He you could know, be Titanic, doing a little Titanic thing. There's <laughs> no. all these options that we have. We always have options, right? So we're getting the point. We're on the cliff. We're in the journey. We're going. We always have options. We don't always see our options. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we see the path. Sometimes we don't. Got it. So where do we go when we're in that struggle? We usually go to think of something positive in the past. What did I learn from? Right? When did I traverse that, that water and I didn't, I didn't fall in? What did I do right that time? I'm going to do that again, right? How did I not fall off that cliff, right? What did I do that time? So we go to this positive past memory that brings us to where? Hope, joy, excitement. We feel good, right? But then you're about to take that first step. Where does your mind go? Huh? It goes right there. <laughs> to the negative past, the doubt. Oh my gosh. Maybe some of you tried that walk. Oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. To the negative uh, past. Uh, 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 it goes to the negative past, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I took that step and I fell. <laughs> oh, that video I saw, right? America's Funniest Home Videos. It uh -oh. wasn't that funny, right? <laughs> that guy looked like he got hurt, right? <laughs> I don't want to be that guy, funny. right? Right? So your mind automatically goes from the positive past without much thought at all. It's almost instant. Right to the negative past. And you start going through all the things that could go wrong. Think about any other conflict you're involved in. Where you start to think about how you can traverse it and make it through. And then where does your brain go? All the ways it could go bad. I can't talk to that faculty member. I can't talk to my roommate. I can't tell that to my mom. Right? Yeah? Yeah. So what do you get? You feel regret, remorse, resentment, anger. Right? Okay. You see it, daughter? Yeah. She's not happy. Right? Well, what is regret? Oh my gosh. I should have said. I could have done. Why me? Right? Resentment. Why me? Why does this always have to happen to me? Right? Okay. So now we know where we are. Right? You know what we're feeling. That's, that's in the negative past. So then what do you try to do? You try to jump out of it. The negative. And so you're in the negative future, or you're in the negative past, positive past. Then you went to the negative past. So where do you jump? To the... What's on the other side? Which is what? Future. Positive future. Look at that guy. Yeah. He's happy. He's ready. Hey, yeah, yeah. This is good. Yeah, your dreams will come true. Right? Yeah. Oh, right? Yeah, da, 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 right? You got all these. Uh, yeah. So your positive future. Oh my gosh. I, I'm going to make it. I'm going to survive. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Right? All these wonderful things that pop up. Oh, how long does that last? <laughs> Not to run to the other side. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes, most times, when you're in conflict, like that, talking to that faculty member, or talking to that peer, talking to that parent, or caregiver, or family member, where does it go? Wah, wah. The, the, to the negative ne future. To the negative future. It goes right to the negative future. You only last a split second in that split moment, or a few moments in that positive space. Because you're afraid. 
because you have fear. You have <coughs> uh, anxiety. You have expectation. You have assumption. Right? When I walk into that room, I'm supposed to have food for me. The flyer said food. <laughs> it's all gone. This always happens to me. Right? Not too long ago, I had all my boys at the house. And I walked in. It was winter time, so it was dark. And uh, when winter break or whatever. And I'm all excited, right? I finished my day at work. I'm like, oh, I get to go see the boy. And, and, you know, wife and the dog. And I'm all excited, right? So I'm, all, you know, everyone's going to just be like, yeah, what? Right? right? So I walk in. Lights are off, right? The sign says, Happiness is a doggy dance, you know, when you walk in the door. Nice. No dog. Oh, Open the door, there's no dog. No sugar. More Some sugar. of you have that sugar. Yeah. If you have it, stop by the office sometime. Some days she's there. Right? No sugar. Sugar is always excited. Sugar is always excited to see you. She was not there when I opened the door. Aww. 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 Right? Pitch dark living room. I close the door and I kind of see what looks like a body there. Hey. What's going on? Wow. Okay, super angry. Okay, so I go to walk out that room. Walking out, see the other boy. Hey, what's up? Hey, Dad. <laughs> Boom, slams the door behind him. Okay, son. <laughs> All righty. So I walk into the kitchen. I see someone else <laughs> watching TV, right? So I say, hey, what's up? Hello. <laughs> hey, hey, hello. Oh. Nothing. Okay. Rejected by three. Okay. I'll go upstairs. So I go upstairs to the wife's office, right? And the dog's on her lap, so the dog ain't going nowhere. <laughs> right? And I get this. No. Completing an email. Can't talk right now. All right? Hand up. Not even looking at me. Just, no. Wall. I've been in the house for 20 seconds. My expectation was the big hug, right? Welcome. It, was the, it was the positive future. Where am I 20 seconds later? Because I had expectation and assumption. Now every time I walk in the house, I'm anxious. And I'm fearful that it will happen again. Does this sound familiar to any of you? It should, because we're human. We all do it. Right. And so there I am. So what do I do? I walk back downstairs. Well, screw everybody there. Nobody in this family loves me. Mm. Right. So what do I do? I find a bag of chips. <laughs> right. Maybe a bag of candy. And I just start shoveling stuff in my face. Oh, oh yeah. You don't love me. I'll be fat. Right. Oh. Nobody loves a fat person. <laughs> my whole, all of my negative patterns about myself and the world come flying out. And I can't even control it. Right. Even if I don't really believe it. Right? About myself or anyone else. I'm just shoveling that crap in. Right? So what happens? Ten seconds later, the dog comes out. <laughs> bing, 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 bing. She's jumping on my leg. What am I? I'm ready to kick the dog off my leg. <laughs> right? Psh, whatever. Right? Wife comes down. Hey, hon, how was your day? Oh, now you care, huh? Right? 30 seconds I've been in the house and I'm angry. Right? Oh, now you care. Oh, no. Too busy for me earlier. Now you're good enough for me. Now you can. Right? How was your day? Wow. Right? Somebody hears the commotion, puts his phone down. He had the TV on. He puts his phone down, takes his headphones out. How am I going to be a phone and a TV and the headphones? Right? I don't know the context. He comes in. Hey, Dad. Big old hug. I'm like, oh. <laughs> We're going to really hug it. Other boy comes out. Hey, son. Hey, Dad. You all right? Yep, just had to go to the bathroom real bad. <laughs> OK. Can understand. Now I'm trying to come around, I'm trying hard to come around. What the hell's wrong with the guy in the front? Two, three hours later, I find out he got dumped by his girlfriend. Oh. Mm -hmm. I don't know the context of everyone else's experience. My expectation was that I would walk in and everyone hugged me. 
when in reality, I'm a pool ball, so there's flying into a rack of balls, and they're flying all around, and I'm like, where's my hug? But the inertia of my entrance is things flying everywhere, right? And I'm, at, I'm, I'm saying, well, wait a minute, why aren't you staying here? Right? So where do I need to be? Where is the safe space I'm trying to jump to? It's not the negative past. It's not in the past. Right? Not the future. <laughs> this is the spiral. This is the spiral. This is the spiral, because I try to jump and jump and jump and jump. So I go, negative past. Positive. Negative future. And I'm going back and forth. Oh my gosh. And I'm just digging deeper and deeper in that hole. Does that all sound familiar now? Yeah. Right? And I just spiral down and down and down. You heard it in my story. Right? Did that really happen? No. But I like to tell that story because that would have been me a few years ago. Right? But now, now that I have put some time and effort into understanding this and theorizing it, figuring it out, now I can pull myself out of that faster, right? But I could have easily mm. write down, and that spiral killed friendships, relationships, right? Over and over and over again, until I broke it. And I broke it by jumping to the moment. The moment of success, that moment of time that is in that particular space, right? Because in that moment, I can recognize that there it is. All those things that Tadadaho was looking for all those years. And what's there? Love, thankfulness, compassion, empathy, acceptance, and once you get through all those, that filter of those, then you get to the space of forgiveness. You can't forgive in the past. It already happened. You already went over the cliff. You can't forgive in the future. It hasn't happened yet. You have to let it go in the moment, right? Who drove here? Did anyone cut you off in the morning today? driving here, or is it in a hurry? Thinking you're in a hurry, I'm going to be late for class, got to get to my parking spot. Sure. Someone cuts you off, <laughs> right? Oh my gosh, right? And you come into school, what? I almost died, I got a car crash, oh my god, I can't believe it, right? You're angry, that, that, that. can't believe that person, right? Then you go to the next class, oh you got you're lucky I'm here, I almost died on the way here to school today, right? Go to your lab that night. I can't believe I'm here. I almost died today. Right? All day long, you've been talking about this near-death crash experience. Right? Is that person going around all day saying, oh my gosh, lucky I came here. I almost cut somebody off. Right? Are they talking about it? No. Water over the falls. Who is holding it? Who is holding that experience? You. You. So what are you really forgiving? <laughs> Yourself? Yourself. <laughs> For what? Something that... Uh... Or holding on to it. Or holding on. And that's what they brought to Tadagaho. An opportunity to let go in the moment, to forgive himself so that his behavior could change and be something in a space to defend others. And they had to teach Todd how to do that. It took them time to teach Tadadaho. Todd, right? <laughs> Maybe we'll start with T's, right? So, it took time for him to learn how to do this. 
just like it'll take time for you to learn how to be in the moment and pull yourselves out of that spiral. Mm -hmm. But now that you know, and now that you know that anyone in conflict is going through the spiral, because we're all human, you all nodded your head at some point through this process, which means what? We all recognize the journey. So whether you're looking at macro or micro, you're looking at this process of somebody caught in the spiral of conflict. And the space to pull it out is in the moment. Because right? that's where compassion, thoughtfulness, all those other things can happen. All right? And that's what I learned through this whole journey. And all these different places I've been and all these different things. I've, that's what I learned is that it has to exist there. Because those things don't exist. There. So that's really your cup, right? It's like a coffee filter. You pour this conflict into a filter of now, and you get all those things, compassion, love, thoughtfulness, appreciation, acceptance, forgiveness, and then it pours into your cup of conflict resolution, and you can drink from that cup. Okay. So close your eyes. Right. So think about one of your conflicts could be something that happened today or week or last year. Maybe something that's not terribly traumatic, but you know, just one of these conflicts. And think about what could you have done different in that experience if you could go back and say, hey, hey. Try this. Think about this. Think about these options. So this is the reflect to how we learn from our experience. We reflect back. Right. So the reframe comes is once we've realized, okay, these are the different things I could have done, now we reframe those things. Okay. Let me reframe my conflict. So reframe your conflict that you're thinking of. And reframe it in a way so it'll allow those for you to get into the moment of now. Right? So what do you want from that experience? What does the resolution feel like? Right? So it goes from a this is what happened to a I want. And then the last piece, which is the third R, which is rewire. So that's the transition where things go from I want to the moment of now, I am. Okay, open your eyes. How does that feel? To kind of reflect and reframe and then rewire. Anyone have a hard time with it? Rewiring takes a lot of effort, yes. And it doesn't exist in a lot of the conflict resolution books, right? Which is why I'm writing a book about it, right? Because it does take time. What is real rewiring? Cycle analysis, right? right? But there's many other ways. And this is where the Eastern philosophy and all these other things come into my theory, right? And they're all processes of rewiring, right? So part of it is that transition. I don't like, I want, I am, right? So it's one understanding that, but once you get to the I am, now you're recognizing, oh, there's a lot of work here. Yeah, there's a lot of time spent, and I have a whole other chapter on reflecting, reframing, and rewiring, right? That goes through that whole process and what needs to go into your rewire. What's the thought process behind it? How do you rewire neural pathways? How does that impact your DNA, right? If you really want to just do some shortcuts, you can look up Dr. Dispenza, right? He does a lot of rewiring technology. So Syracuse University and Newhouse has this thing called the Mind Lab downtown, right? And they got the things, they put them on your head, right? And they read your eyes and they read your emotions and all these different cool AI technologies and all this stuff that they do at the Mind Lab, right? Dr. Dispenza has his own Mind Lab. And he focuses on rewiring. And so all of his research goes to that space. How do we rewire? How do we best Right? Because 
Because like I said, years ago, I would have walked into that <laughs> house for those three boys, and I would have shoveled food down my mouth. Obviously, I'm not doing that right now. Right? Now I'm under 190 pounds now. But that guy was close to 220. I had to rewire myself. And I've done it through this process. So, where does it come from? So, the Tadadaho before Sid Hill. So, um, before I show you the screen, <coughs> uh, I'll explain the story. So, the Haudenosaunee and indigenous people have gone through a lot of struggles, a lot of trauma, a lot of attacks. Not only with our own, you know, thousands of years ago when we formed this peaceful core in the democratic process, but then later when all of these other ancestors of the people who are alive now came to this land. And there was a lot of conflict there and a lot of struggle. And it resulted in a lot of stuff that happened to indigenous people. Forced encampments, reservation, land stolen, right? boarding schools, hunting the hair, <clears throat> being beaten to speak your language, sing your songs. You know, <clears throat> at 47, I'll be at 47. I was born, and for the first four years of my life, I was breaking U.S. federal law. You are a job. By speaking my language, by singing my songs, and by going to ceremony. That's me. Right? Out of Davos, Leon Shagoa. Excuse me. Leon Shagoa. Was tangentially related to my family. So, I fam. Yeah. I family. And he himself went through his own traumas. Mm -hmm. Friends went to boarding schools, beaten. Some of them never made it home from school, right? So it's happening in Canada, whether truth and reconciliation and finding bodies. Guess what? Well, the U.S. has twice as many boarding schools in Canada. So probably twice as many bodies. Let's think about that for a second. So. This person doing a documentary was asking him about this experience, about the history, about broken treaties and boarding schools and all this stuff. And he even shared a story about how his own daughter lost her life. <clears throat> and uh, you know that it wasn't his job to be that person's <clears throat> jury. That he would have to let it go and forgive. Right? <clears throat> so after all these stories, about this terrible history, genocide, basically. Um, he was asked this question. If you could wish away the white people and make this native land again, would you? His answer, creator brought all of us together for a reason. I don't know what that reason is, but it's up to all of us to figure Big, it out. Figure that out. This is what inspires me to do my work. This is what inspires me to include my theory, my cultural theory and background, and include it in this process. Because without that, and without this experience here, and without the things that I learned in all of those other places, and without Mark, this knowledge is not able to happen. It's not able to be shared. Well, it's up to all of us to figure it out. That's tradition. Well, they did make the creator was the one that made this. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's told another part of the story. <laughs> <coughs> so, but this is my inspiration every day. Right. Every day. Why I do what I do. Right. Why I show up to work every day. Right. Knowing that I'm going to talk to somebody right. who's not going to look like me. 99% of my work mm. does not look like me when I look in the mirror. Oh, yeah. But what I do know is that we all have this shared human experience of conflict and how we transition mm -hmm. through it. And it's up to me to figure out a way to help all of us work through that. So thank you for letting me come in today and share.
Maybe you. I'm five minutes over. Um, that's it. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> yeah. I have a question, Neil. Sure. Um, I, f I find this quote very, very humbling of my own position in history, and I want to ask ask you how how do you reconcile that um, this idea about being together for a reason with the evidence of so much suffering and children's sure. bodies in boarding schools? How, how how do we reconcile these these uh, seemingly <clears throat> incompatible notions. Sure, you know, and I think that's that's the mm -hmm. gift of that original story of Todd, you know, Dickie's journey <laughs> as Todd Adaho. Um, People <laughs> always think it's Theodore, is my... Yeah, no, it's Todd Adaho. Yeah, it's, not, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not short for Theodore. Yeah. Um, it, it's actually part of... It's part of that process, right? That's that's the thing, is that uh, that transition of that um, exists no matter what goes on around us, right? So, you know, the explanation of that original story is, it was that. We had that too. We had all of those terrible things. We had all of that, you know, um, I, I ask this question when I talk about this process of peace. I say, could you forgive somebody, could you forgive the person who ate your uncle? <laughs> Most people have a hard time answering that question. And some people will say it depends on which uncle. <laughs> right? Eat that one, not that one. I like this one, right? I like this uncle. You can eat that uncle, right? He's, uh, he's, he's, he's our jerk, right? But it doesn't matter, right? And so within our culture, we talk a lot about that process. That, that earth is a journey, right? And we're going to go over waterfall. We're going to be on the edge of cliffs. We're going to try to climb across trees because we think we can. Right? We're going to put ourselves in that eminent danger all the time because we are human. And so it's because of that that those things happen. It's because of ego, right? <coughs> the, e the ego. 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 Ego, not ego. Right? That we want to be right. right? Ego. <laughs> Excuse me. My assistant likes to put a quote that I say every once in a while. I'll turn it into a little sign. And there's a sign, and it was in her little cubby. What sign? And I said, oh, that's pretty cool. Where'd you see that one? Where'd you get that? She goes, I made it. And I was like, oh, you made it? Where's the quote from? She goes, you. I'm like, what? I was like, I said that? That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, it said, the ego wants to be right. The heart wants to get along. The ego is what causes all that suffering. The ego creates the space for all those things to happen. I'm better than you. My way is better than your way. You have no voice. My voice is the only one that matters. Those are all ego. That's all being right. Right? And so this concept allows you to go into that space of ego and to forgive it and let it go. And say, no, I'm going to transcend to a different space. I'm going to move to a different plane. I'm going to take the fight to a new field a new space. And that allows that transition. <coughs> is to allow the understanding that all of that suffering offers us an opportunity to grow. Yeah. Yeah. So, and without all of that suffering, you all wouldn't be here. You all wouldn't have a major or something to study. And you would have things to problem solve around. So what would you do? Right? That's why you're here. Right? Because of all that suffering. Because you learned about it. You said, oh, i got to do something different about that. Yeah. So you got to take it to a different plane. you got to take the fight to a new field. Say, so, no, 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 the fight's not there. The fight's over here. But when you get here, well, the rules are different, by the way. 
<laughs> right? Because that's what your research is all about. That's T dot times pi. That's what your research is all about. How do I change the playing field to level it? Because then we can have resolution. Because the ego is not going to let it happen. So, as a culture, that's how we justify it, right? So I've had that question a number of times as I do cultural presentations, and especially historical presentations that go over a lot of those things that happen. They'll ask me, how am I not angry? It's this. Right? Because uh, other people could go through it and be angry, and be mad, and be, you know, and exhibit that in a variety of different ways. Right? <coughs> but here's something to think about. Say, there's a group of people, right? They're the, I'll use the billiard example again, right? They're the billiard balls, right? Sorry for the pun. The white ball <laughs> flies into all the colored balls, <clears throat> knocks them all over the place, right? And then these balls are flying all over the place, right? And so the assumption is, oh, all these balls are flying all over the place. We've got to worry about where all those balls are. But what about the existing trauma that happens to the white ball? Right? Because energy is never dead. It just transfers and transforms space. So you can put spin on that ball, and it'll do certain things. And you can try to steer it. But at the end of the day, that ball still has energy that it has to resolve. And there's books on it. And there's a, type, there's a name for it. You probably heard it. And you say, nah, I don't want to believe in that. That's not true. Or, ooh, that's true. we got to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And that phrase is white fragility. That's the residual of the trauma of banging into those balls and the spin that is a culture or society that you created to move that ball to a certain space. Does that make sense? It's a good metaphor. It's a great metaphor. So that allows me to go through my day and say, yeah, you're all right. We'll figure it out. Because if I think about the fact that I'm flying around the <coughs> table, That's what resolution is. That's a big part of what resolution becomes, too, is as we transcend beyond that, we get to move into new spaces. Great question, though. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I always have an answer. Uh, thanks for coming. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, no worries. I understand. I was once a student, too. Yeah. No worries. Um, but it sounds like, um, or I was just thinking about, um, this, I was taught in one method of conflict resolution, resolution there's mm -hmm. apologize and then make it right. And those are two equally important parts sure. of conflict. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to solve them. Well, not sure. solve, but whatever. Um, where does the make it right come in there for you? For me? In any sort of conflict. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, <clears throat> once we've reframed it and rewired it, <coughs> then we're able to make it right, right? Because otherwise it's a forced apology, right? Thank you for coming. Yeah, who's gotten a forced apology before? <laughs> How does that make you feel? I'm sorry. <laughs> Whatever, right? You don't mean it, right? So is that really making it right? Mm -hmm. right? Making it right becomes the empathy, the compassion, the thoughtfulness mm -hmm. that exists in the moment. Right? So you have to be in that moment mm -hmm. in order to give and make it right. So you have to help someone get to that moment, moment of now before they're ready to make it right. Mm -hmm. So it can't come before any of those other things. So for me, it does come later after that person has a chance to kind of reflect what's going on, I'm in the spiral, I gotta get out, I don't want this. Or, oh my gosh, your actions have hurt this many people. Can you think about that? What can we do right? So 
But if that person is never ready to reconcile yeah, what their choices have done to other people, yeah. how are you going to make it right? Right? And what is that person missing? that they can't see the humanity in another person. They're really devoid of seeing that in themselves, as much as they want to deflect it. And, right, so they're not even the psychology of that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that it more has to do with their own loss, mm -hmm. the lack. That's the spiral. You're focused on the fact that you don't have it. I don't have, I have regret, I have resentment, I have remorse, I didn't get, I didn't do, right? Or the fear or the anxiety, I'm not going to get it, I'll never have it, it won't work out. Both of them focused on lack. Yeah. Right down the hole, right? And if you have a leader, right, at a high level, or a dictator, who is <coughs> on people, what are they really pointing at? Themselves, right? So when they are singling out certain types of people, they're really looking at the lack in themselves, where they exist in that space, right? So, and then you have to have someone to, or some way to work through a maneuver into that space to help them understand that. And they have to be ready. That doesn't always happen. So then you satellite diplomacy and all these other techniques, right, to mitigate or minimize the collateral damage. So that becomes conflict resolution theory, is to minimize the collateral damage instead of resolving it with the person, with Tadadaho, <laughs> aka Tadiki. <laughs> He's a good sport, that's why I picked him. <laughs> Great question, though. I appreciate that. Yeah, because it is. It's a powerful thought process within the space of resolution and what you're studying every day. And just to add to that, I mean, I think some people in the field of conflict resolution would say um, psychological solution, like the make it right ha sometimes has to be an economic make it right. It can't be I've reframed. Um, but for Neil, it's just I'm getting this powerful, <coughs> you know, that there's no amount of money that can substitute for you yeah. for this work. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But can this work substitute for? A lot of money. Sure. Well, it, it can't. Well, and that's what that's, the, that's what that's Canada is trying to do yeah. with the Truth and Reconciliation. They're putting money behind. <laughs> let's let's make this right, right? As opposed to saying, let's give you money and say we're done with it, right? That's the forced apology. Okay. Is the here's some money. Yep. Here you go. Now stop. Be quiet. Stop hugging. Right. As opposed to. Let me put all these resources in so that you feel like you can come and be part of this, so that you're hurt. That's the difference. Is that not a paternalistic take, though? The, I will create a space for you to come participate with me after, like, dismantling your community and, like, like killing your people for centuries. Sure, like, it, it could be. Yeah, and right. that's why you have movements so, like Remake so as, as people that have been, like, persecuted um, yeah. or marginalized, like, do we have space to be like, I'd rather take the money. Like, I'd sure. rather take whatever um, is materially beneficial to me. Sure. And, like, what if I, what, like, if, if that is the forced apology, <clears throat> what if, like, I'm, like, I'd rather have that? And there's spaces within the truth and reconciliation process for that. Okay. Right? So it's participation sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Here's an example. So out of, out of Canada's truth and reconciliation, they created what's called the blanket exercise or the Kairos like an exercise. Syracuse has actually done it a few times. So it started as Canada, then it broke into province, Canada provinces, mm -hmm. and then it went to Australia and the US, right, because they had indigenous populations too. Now you have Kairos, USA, Northeast, mm -hmm. which is here, right, which is the one that Syracuse is bringing here mm -hmm. through the neighbors of Onondaga Nation. A fundamental process mm -hmm. of that truth and reconciliation is that there are trained facilitators, indigenous and none, that are part of that exercise. And I'll say this, the process is we pay the indigenous people, the non-indigenous people are volunteers. Mm -hmm. So you participate in the growth process and you get paid for it. 
but you know that others are not. So you, in some way, you accept the responsibility, but it also offers a conduit to say, yeah, I'm putting money in my pocket. That's cool. You know what I'm saying? And that's fundamental to that, part, that one particular process, right. that the indigenous people are paid for their participation in it, and the non-indigenous people are not, <coughs> as facilitators. <coughs> so there's spaces to do it, right? Um, there's also a lot of research on handouts that don't always do people really well, right? So that's also part of the thought process of creating that relationship, because you have a lot of communities in the U.S. and Canada that have casinos that have per caps, and they just hand out money to the mission members, drug addiction, social unrest, increase in violence, increase in all kinds of other stuff, right? Not because they don't have money. It's because of how... Um, the society is supporting that process, right? So there are a lot of detrimental things that happen just by handing people money. So like that, you're not making it an either or, though. It's an and. It's, it's not an like either or. Right? It's never really an either yeah. or. It it's always is an and, right? Mm -hmm. You can do the per cap if you have social support processes and things to support it, right? Or requirements to do certain things. You get an education, you get a larger per cap. Some, some communities are doing that. Other communities will say, no, you don't get a per cap, but we put umpteen million dollars into this pool, and then we create all these programs for it, and you benefit from all those programs. And all you have to do is come in and write a proposal, and we'll pay you for it. So now you get it, but you're responsible. There's a responsibility piece there about how you get that money. Uh, Dave Chappelle made a few jokes about that, right? in his show, right? He talked about per cap and all that. That was a whole, whole little episode that he did about what would happen if all of a sudden reparations happened and how much money would that be and what would happen. And the part of that joke is the FUBU stock went up, you know, 800 points, right? Because all these people have money and they just start putting money and investing in different things, right? And so that was this joke. Um, he used it as a joke, right? But he uses per cap or um, reparations or however you want to describe it as a conduit to say what would happen if you just give a huge influx of money to a group of people and said, have at it. Right. And it really is just here, we're done. Don't bring it up no more. Like this whole, like making it right. Uh -huh. I guess I sort of have two questions. So. One is, can everyone sort of like make it right? And if so, is it up to the individual? Like, is it the individual's definition of what's right? Like, do they have to come to that place individually? Or is it other, like, how others perceive it? Sure. So for me, in my job, that's my job. My job is to create a space as an ombud so that you two in conflict can understand the context of the other's experience so that you understand that your choices and your actions, how it impacted the other side of the table, and therefore to say, oh, how can I make it right? How can I make the context of that experience better? How can I change things, right? So that's my job as an ombud, right? So of all the places and things that happen in Syracuse University, formal structures, complaints, going up the hierarchy within the department and the college and all those things, so keeping it in the college or going to Title IX, or stop, stop bias, yours, HR, DPS, whatever it might be, those are all formalized structures and more like court. And if they're found guilty, you have to apologize to them. Is that making it right? Does his apology make it right when he says, sorry? Right? So it's beyond formal structure, right? So the ombuds creates a space for the context of the experience to be shared so that that same process is now no longer, I'm sorry, but wow, I had no idea that impacted you that way. I'm sorry. Because then compassion has a space to come into the room. Right? And it's pulled out of the formal structures. Now, you can have an apology that sounds pretty compassionate and authentic and then have behavior that goes. So that's when you go back to the court system and go right up the ladder. 
hold their feet to the fire because they obviously didn't learn from it. Right? And that's what we had to do to Tadadaho, is teach him how to do that. So he would learn. So everyone knew we have to watch this person and teach them socially, train them to what it means to make it right. So maybe your thought, your question is really, how can you impact your social structures around you to see that making it right is actually the right thing to do? That's a big systemic journey that you're about to go on. Yeah. But why not? Right? If that's where your passion is, figure it out. I'm not going to tell you how. I'm going to say, let's figure it out together. Right? You're welcome. Or, sorry. Right? I don't know. Right? But either way, you're on your journey. Right? And you're going to go over your waterfalls, and I'm going to go over mine. And when we cross paths, we cross paths. Great. And when we don't, we don't. Right? But that's the systemic process that impacts the Antar for making it right. Right? So it's not always so cut and dry. Cut and dry wants to, is formal. Formal wants to be cut and dry. Compassion is a great area everywhere. And that's what I do every day. <laughs> and that's why ombuds exist. Yeah. So that's why my theory has that. Because that's what I do every day. Sure. Thank you. Um, so, this is more about your experience as an ombudsman. Om sure. Um, I know a lot of people who fundamentally don't trust ombudsman people mm -hmm. simply because they are paid for, paid by the university. Sure. So, what would you say to someone about that? Know the story of how I got here. Okay. Okay, so, <laughs> if they're at a university and they meet their ombudsman person and they just flat out don't trust that person, they sure. just accept it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's fine. Everyone has the opportunity to say that and do that. My backstory is pretty interesting. So my, and what's interesting about it too is I'm still engaging in the process while I'm the ombuds. I'll explain that. It'll make more sense at the end of the story. So my eldest brother, he's two years younger than myself. My sister's the oldest, and then I have your brother, bro your and brother, then another Brad. brother, your brother Brad. Barry, then Brad, then me, <laughs> right? And Nancy's the oldest. And so Barry got a scholarship to go here to play lacrosse and full ride scholarship, so he comes to school here, right? And then he goes to Canada to play in Canada, and he becomes the Canadian Athlete of the Year. Wow. And comes to Syracuse and gets put on the bench. Okay. Then he goes to Canada again, Athlete of the Year. Comes back to the SU, back on the bench. They put him in, he scores. Back on the bench. Why? Right? So he's asking himself, why? Why am I such a good athlete and celebrated in other places and I come here and I am not? Why am I on the bench and not allowed to go on the field? And why, when I go on the field and I'm successful, which is what I'm told the team wants to be, I'm pulled off the field? Because the way that he did it was different. His worldview that he had and was introduced into the team was different. Oh, and by the way, he was a 4.0 student in high school and a 4.0 student here. So it had nothing to do with his brain power or his academic thought process. It was the fact that he was willing to verbalize and vocalize his worldview in a very thoughtful and eloquent, eloquent way. Okay. Something that my whole family has. Right? So um, thankfully, it's one of the gifts that I got too. Right? So here he is, three years in, decides, goes to Canada again, plays in this world tournament, makes the all-world team and says, F Syracuse. I'm not going back. Full ride scholarship. 4.0. Walks away. Why? Right? So we start to ask ourselves why. At the same time, my dad is working with New York State on a curriculum to educate people about the Haudenosaunee and indigenous per worldview perspective. So 1979, New York State Department of Education says, too controversial, can't include it. So he says, great, I'll take this and take it around the country and find a publisher. Comes to Syracuse Press. And what does Syracuse Press tell him? Your view is not welcome here. It's too controversial. No view. So not only does Syracuse University 
reject my brother. And then three years later, bring in the gay brothers who did the same thing, but they were white, and celebrate them as kings. 1988, the gay brothers are, oh, right? 1979, my brother is, boo. My brother went to Vancouver. The gay brothers are from Vancouver. And they watch my brother and say, do I want to copy that? Then they come here and do it, and they're celebrated. OK? My dad, watching all this. I'm four years old in 1980. Yeah. You, so, you're four years so old. So I'm told this. You can go to sporting events at Syracuse University. I'll take your friends, too. My dad had a decent job. You were four years old. Under one caveat, you have to cheer against Syracuse University. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent my entire formative years as a young person coming here for sports events and cheering against Syracuse. <laughs> and we would travel to other games and events in other colleges and to cheer against Syracuse. <laughs> Right? As a family, we would cheer against Syracuse. Right? So then I come through high school. I'm being recruited by Division I schools. And I end up in the office here at Syracuse University. And I know damn well I'm not coming here. And they know I'm not coming here. But I sat there with my cousin because he was excited to get recruited as well. We both ended up going to another college together. And we got to play against Syracuse. And it was nice hearing the coach say, they only got one guy. Stop that one guy. And that one guy was me. Right, that was pretty cool. Right? I was really proud of that. That I got to stick it to SU. Literally on field. Right? Okay. So that's my journey. Right? My dad, after 30 years of working and fighting against New York State and the federal US federal government, gets given an honorary law degree by Syracuse University. Shares the stage with Joe Biden. Before, a few years before that happens, that's when I start my journey here at Syracuse. Going to grad school, getting my master's, working at Sy Syracuse, right? <clears throat> so, my brother, the other Maybe brother. Brad? Brad. Makes a joke and says, well, Dad, now that you have an honorary law degree from SU, now you have to cheer for Syracuse. <laughs> and what does he say? He says... He says, I will cheer for whoever I want. I will cheer for <laughs> whoever I want. And I will never cheer for Syracuse. Even though your son works for SU, it doesn't matter. That's his journey, not mine. So as an ombud, who's an ear to the people, who hears everybody's struggles and problems at Syracuse University, and then shares those trends with the chancellor or board of trustees or whoever, deans, you think I'm really in the business of being here to defend them, or look after them, or protect them? I'm actually getting paid to cheer against Syracuse. <laughs> I'm getting paid to do what I've done my whole life. <laughs> so if they don't trust me, that's up to them, not up to me, because that's my perspective. And my job is to give everyone a voice, whether it's a person who is struggling with inclusion, or accessibility, or diversity, or a political stance that isn't welcomed in the space. Uh, my job is to give that space voice. Whether I believe in it or not, whether I agree with it or not, my job is to understand their perspective, to give the context, because if I can sit in that space and find humanity in that person, then there's hope. That's another thing I always say when people come out of my office, right? Because they'll hear all kinds of things about all kinds of people, right? Mm -hmm. Three, four, or five people come in, right? And then that person comes in. And we have a conversation. And I say, well, guess what, Judy? Judy's my assistant. And she'll say, what? And I'll say, yep. You know what I'm going to say? And she starts to giggle. And I say, there's no such thing as an evil person. Only bad choices. Mm -hmm. Tadadaho wasn't evil. He was hurt. He was traumatized. He had some struggles. And he needed someone to show him some compassion to realize that he didn't have to be that way. Do you think your faculty got to become tenured faculty without being unscathed? Without being hazed? Without being traumatized? Ask him. Without being traumatized. 
They all have their story. And I know it because I've been here in every role. And so I'm not surprised when anyone comes in and says, I was traumatized. It's just join the club. Let's figure it out. Let's work through it. And then I'll share your trend with the university. And hopefully, maybe someday, it'll all get better. And we'll, we'll have to actually come up with policies on these things. But there's a space for everyone to come into my office and share their experience. Everyone. I'm reading articles and research on uh, <clears throat> journalists. There's one journalist who makes a dinner once a week, blue and red. You're welcome. Puts them in the same room at a dinner table. Two and a half hours. Every week he has a dinner, he hosts a dinner. And then he wrote a few articles about it. About what did he learn when they had to sit and share food and find the humanity in each other. And find the humanity yeah. in each other. That's each other. That's delicious, powerful. In each other. What you're doing and what you're studying is, could be you know, atomic bomb powerful in a good way. Love bombs. Love bombs. Yeah, love bombs. Everyone needs some love bombs. Resolution bombs. bombs. You need some posters. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for coming in today. Absolutely. And, uh, talking with us. I'm sure we could carry this conversation on for a lot longer. I'm sure. I know people have classes that they need to get to. Uh, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for coming in. <laughs> Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Time to fly. Oh my God.